This is the ascent portion of our mission. And the countdown of the Cape just went flawlessly. We were really, really pleased with the way things went down, went on down there. The engine's starting. You can see the shock waves come out of the throats of the, the nozzles. The nozzles vibrate. The engines get up and stable in about six seconds. Uh, solid rocket motors fire, and, and we're off. And uh, for a new guy doing this the first time, it's really a thrill. And that thing feels like being on a rough train while the solid rocket motors are firing. If you all have been on rough railroad track, that's about what it feels like. And uh, it's a very interesting ride. You can function normally. And right before we lifted off, Cripp said, get ready for the ride of your lives. And he was right. It's the ride of your life. So it's still really a, a big thrill on your third time, too. <laughs> the, uh, one, of the, one of the neat things about this mission was we are going to do direct insertion into orbit. So we didn't do an orbital maneuvering system one burn right after the main engine's cut off. So we're going right into orbit off the pad. And we're going up 250 miles. So the trajectory and everything was a little bit different. And it made, uh, made a real interesting ride out of it. The uh, solid rocket motors, the engines, and everything just are magnificent. We didn't have a glitch the whole ascent, which is really nice. You don't want any glitches when this kind of stuff's going on outside your window. <laughs> we all kept on watching Crip make sure this is the way it's really supposed to be. Yeah. <laughs> okay, solid rocket motors separated. You saw the uh, plumes from the uh, separation motors. Those fog up our windows pretty good up in front. They, they put a haze on the, on the forward windows when they go off, and you get a nice flash in the windows, but it's a nice smooth separation. This is our external tank coming in by Hawaii. One of our test objectives was to put that tank in so they could take pictures of it. This is the tank breaking up just south of Hawaii. And it's low light TV, so you get some blooming in it, but you can see, also see the rather large pieces of the tank and how much it's broken up. And they were trying to measure the footprint of those pieces as they came into the ocean to see how big uh, the dispersion was on them. So that's all, all bits and pieces of the big tank we carry. Looked like it lit up the area pretty good over there. And this next picture is the orbiter coming right along behind. And if it hadn't been for the uh, Ohm's burn, we'd been right behind the tank, <laughs> which we didn't want to do. So. This next series just goes through each of the guys to make sure you prove that we're on board, which we were. Uh, some of our going through our little activities and getting squared away. That shot shows uh, Ox with the Linhoff camera we had on board. It's the first time we've flown that. It's uh, got a five inch by four inch square uh, sort of, uh, format that uh, really uh, makes a nice picture. It's that Texas coast picture we saw, saw a while ago uh, was shot from that. DJ? On uh, day two, we started a sequence of RMS activities that would uh, result in the deploy of uh, LDEF. And um, can't say <coughs> enough about our Canadian friends that, that uh, built and designed the RMS. It's just a beautiful flying uh, piece of hardware. Uh, this is the starboard grapple fixture of LDEF uh, that we used for the deploy. And um, uh, essentially, the payload's tied down in the bay with some latches. And once the RMS has it securely grappled, uh, Crip released the uh, latches, and we pulled it out and put it through its paces for a couple hours. And um, very steadily uh, poised the orbiter in the right attitude and released the, uh, the payload uh, no rates. LDEF is unique, and it is a very simple payload, no gyroscopes or anything like that nature on board. And, uh, it was incumbent upon us to, to re release it without tipping it or, ha or getting any kind of motion started. Uh, we hope that the next 10 months to a year it will stay in this exact attitude that we left it in for recovering. Uh, we also carried a unique camera on board that's referred to as IMAX. It shoots a 70 millimeter uh, movie film. And uh, here it shows a scene with me loading the magazine and uh, running it through. Uh, it's about 1,000 feet of film in a mag. TJ? I had a lot of explaining to do what I was doing within the bag here. <laughs> <laughs> Every time they saw me at the mid-deck, I was in the bag. But uh, that's what we used to change the film out from the can into the magazine. We were uh, getting ready for the rendezvous here on day three, and, uh, and we got excellent support from the ground all the way in, and the onboard system worked just fine. We uh, made the rendezvous without any problem at all. This is uh, in the bay in the MMU, getting ready to take off for the satellite. See the T-pad sticking out there in front. Flight over to the satellite uh, was it was just like we practiced in the simulator, except the view was a little better. And see, uh, we were a little closer than uh, the 200 feet that we planned, and so I only did a two potato burn instead of a two and a half potato burn. So I went a little slower than. But all that felt very comfortable from my standpoint of watching the satellite and watching uh, Pinky do the flyover just like, uh, just like we planned it. It's 
a nice stable device that uh, the MMU really performed superbly throughout the flight. The MMU was really a very, very nice machine to fly. You could put it wherever you wanted. Uh, flying up on the satellite was uh, just like, uh, just like we'd done in the simulator, all the way up to the point here where we attempt to do a dock, and uh, the T-pad hits that little pin that's sticking out and bounces right off. That's a view from the helmet-mounted camera. The satellite initially was rotating at about uh, nine tenths of a degree per second about its long axis uh, before the. Uh, attempts to grapple it. This, I think, is the last uh, attempt I made at uh, doing the docking. We had some pretty good rates on the satellite already. You can see, go in there and watch, I'll bounce right out again. It when, bounce out at about the same rate you go in. Uh, when Pinky bounced off for the third time, I guess I became convinced that we were not going to be able to uh, to get it with the T-pad and it didn't look to me like it was worth trying to come back and get the other T-pad because I didn't have any reason to think it'd work any better. We did have a, a rotating grapple up our sleeve, however the satellite was tumbling end over end as you can see here and uh, the uh, the grapple fixture is right under one of those solar rays so there's no way we'd be able to attempt the, uh, the rotating grapple either. That was when I asked uh, Pinky if he thought he could try uh, grabbing hold of one of the solar rays which uh, what he did here. And the MMU, again, uh, performed flawlessly. It was a fairly easy task just to fly up and uh, grab the solar array and walk out to, to, to the edge of it and try and stabilize the satellite. And uh, when, when I let go of the satellite, we'd, uh, we all thought we had it stabilized, but yeah. there was some energy in there someplace. Uh, it uh, basically had stopped uh, rotating in, uh, in the pitch and yaw axes, and the only thing we had going was, it appeared to us, was that a little roll around the long axis again, which is what we wanted. Uh, so we brought uh, Pinky back in and uh, and attempted to go ahead and, and grapple it. However, when we went back, it actually developed more of a tumble again. However, this time it was in a, in a mode that we thought we could uh, gain access to the grapple fixture. We made about four attempts at it, and uh, it uh, was tumbling in such a fashion that uh, TJ came within inches of getting it one time. I thought for sure he had it, and so it, it blossomed. Uh, our TV camera did that he uses for the grapple, and I really uh, contributed that mostly with the, the reason that he actually didn't get a hold of it that time. Um, the ground told us they thought they might be able to stabilize it, which was new data to us, and, uh, and they gave us some fuel figures that what they needed, so we elected to go ahead and go along with that option and, and backed out and, uh, to try again another day. This is letting the bees out of their little house here, kind of. We did this oh, a couple times a day. It was uh, good entertainment, if nothing else, and we were watching their progress on their, uh, on their honeycomb. Yeah, we were made sure that there was no way they were going to get out of there. <laughs> <laughs> I checked that first thing. <laughs> this is a little bit of uh, in-flight repair with the EVA power tool. We weren't, we weren't uh, programmed to use it inside the vehicle, but it turned out it was a really good way to uh, take off and put on panels so that we can get at some filters inside the vehicle and clean them. And uh, Pinky did most of the work, but this is just me doing some, uh, putting some in just for practice. You know, the government runs on paper, and uh, we have to have our teleprinter on board. Uh, it's just taking a message out of the teleprinter for the day. And uh, when we changed our flight plan there, we got flight plans up from the ground every day like that. And they do our daily exercise like we always do. So we, we have a treadmill on board, and uh, we all spent 10, 20 minutes a day on the treadmill whenever we could find time. Okay, and we're getting set up to go in and... Um try the second rendezvous attempt. Incidentally, from a rendezvous standpoint, we, we noticed a, a few minor uh, anomalies with respect to that, but the basic system really works superbly. Uh, rendezvous works just like it did back in the Gemini days, as far as I'm concerned. We can get two satellites together, and uh, uh, we'll probably get a chance to exercise that extensively out in the future. That's the slowest anyone ever saw Crippen move inside a shuttle. He was <laughs> doing that so we could take a picture of him. Rapid pilot. Always easier in zero G. Moving around up there is really nice. 
put on the seat belt just to hold me in the seat while we were doing some of our burns. You notice it takes a few books to do that operation. We got, we got them spread out everywhere. We uh, came in and rendezvous with the satellite the next, uh, next time, and uh, it had uh, about uh, 0.5 degrees per second rotation rate going, and this was just the way that uh, we had practiced it down here on the ground. Uh, maneuvered in, and uh, CJ grabbed hold of it with no problems whatsoever. That's it, the gold thing outside the, outside the window there. And you can also see the arm moving in the other window, so that was right about the grapple time. This is the uh, solar max stowed in the flight service structure, and just the way we wanted to see it in the first day, but we finally got it there. This is uh, the guy we called Oscar. This was the uh, third uh, spacesuit we had on board. To show you what the it's kind of a demonstration here, just how easy it is to move things around. This weighs about 375 pounds. This is where the guy said, "Oh, that feels good." <laughs> <laughs> Been in there all this time. The spacesuit comes in basically about uh, four pieces. Here, you take his pants off, and uh, he's got two gloves and a hat. It's a uh, we had excellent. Uh, <laughs> luck with our spacesuits. I, mine was absolutely no problem at all. Pinky had a little problem with his uh, air conditioner. But in general, the suits work really well. This is the uh, Solar Max when it's rotated down and then it's uh, twisted around so that we can get at the operating end of it so we can do our repair. The uh, structure that this thing sits on, the flight support structure, was uh, built up at Goddard and it worked very well. The scope was our valet for the EVAs. Uh, we couldn't have gotten uh, in and out of the suits uh, in a real efficient manner without Dick. He helped us a lot. This was the, uh, about the only films we got of the uh, change out on the uh, ACS module. We did most of it in the evening there before we came up <coughs> to the light. These guys were going so fast we couldn't take any pictures. Slow down, we'll get some sunlight. <laughs> you can see the big blue uh, tool there is the module servicing tool. This is like a big torque wrench, uh, and the satellite was built to be serviced in space on these particular uh, elements, so it was a fairly easy job to do. Just a matter of sticking this uh, tool into the into the hole there where the where the screw was, this big Acme screw, unbolting it, and there's only two screws holding each one. Just standing on the end of the uh, remote manipulator on the uh, manipulator foot restraint there, or the platform that you. Uh, work off of. We had tools and whatnot, and it was an excellent platform to, uh, to do work from in space. Either uh, TJ and we even let Crip fly me around a little bit. Yeah, they even let the old CDR <laughs> drive around. This is up working on the uh, main electronics box. Mick and I took turns uh, standing in there and working on it. Uh, again, it's really a nice machine. This is from the helmet-mounted camera, just how many wires are in there. I don't even know how many there were, but there's a whole bunch of wires. This is the part I think I mentioned to you folks. I, if there was anything I really didn't think that the we might be able to do, it was to change out all these little electrical connectors, and uh, these guys made it look like a piece of cake, uh, just like they'd been doing it all their lives. There's 11 connectors, and each one of them had up to like 78 wires in it. So, it was, but it would turn out to be, uh, after all the training we did, it really wasn't very difficult. The interesting thing was looking inside that box there, inside the satellite. There's a whole lot of parts in there. Now, the the reason they made it look easy was that they. They practiced it enough. They had done that task hundreds of times. This is uh, doing a survey of the satellite before we redeployed it. Uh, that was really quite a ride to get put up on a pedal still like that. <laughs> I was having a lot of fun driving Pinky and Ox around it. For a while there, I thought I was having more fun than they were, but I'm sure I wasn't. And then uh, to cap it all off, got to fly around the MMU and do an engineering test flight on it. To uh, We're looking at center gravity offsets and things like that, but in general, as it seemed, I was having a real fun time in it. It's a <coughs> fine machine. It flies just exactly the way you want it to, and I think we'll get a lot of use out of it in the future. It affords a fine view of the world here. You see the two little lights on the side of my helmet. We had uh, helmet-mounted lights to uh, illuminate the work you're doing at night, and they work extremely well, too. They're just battery-powered lights. After um, Pinky and Ox had finished the repair work, uh, and that was a pretty long day, uh, EVA and all, and the next, uh, next day, um, Goddard said they were ready for the deploy of the satellite. They had checked it out overnight, and uh, we hoisted it up on the arm in the proper position, and 
pointed it toward the sun with the orbiter, and then uh, RMS did the rest of the work by releasing it with that uh, uh, much noticeable uh, rates on the on the uh, satellite, back the arm away, and then Scopes took over uh, flying the orbiter uh, back and away. And all that, all that went very nominally. We backed away from it and uh, departed the area about 45 minutes after we uh, deployed the satellite. We were planning on staying around a little longer than that, but it, all the test and checkout was done. Everybody was happy with the satellite, so we went off and left it. And hopefully we left it in a lot better condition than we found it. Did leave it in a lot better We condition. did leave it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is uh, more of the housework. I did a lot of a lot of the cooking and bottle washing, and uh, if you look out the window there, you can see the snow going by. We're doing a water dump at the same time. Uh, cooking a meal is about like doing it on the ground there. This is, a bank, this is a bank shot by Crippen. Yeah. <laughs> Trying to get my eggs in my mouth. <laughs> we do. You do tend to eat in space like you do on the ground. Almost. Almost. <laughs> <laughs> Some of us do. <laughs> Land shark. Scope's got all the dried fruit in the pa pantry there. Nobody else seemed to like Stopped it, but it was really down. good. At least, at least I eat in space. I eat like I do on the ground. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> so did Ox. So did Ox. <laughs> That was a real rotating grapple, old boy. <laughs> yeah, we gave us time to play up there, too. Yeah. <laughs> Finally, they told us we had to come home and quit playing up. <laughs> we uh, had to wave off once. Uh, I had lots of practice of that, having done it on my last flight, so it uh, we worked exactly the same way. No problems at all. Just tell us where you want to land. Mm -hmm. These are 16 millimeter. Uh, motion picture taken out of the overhead window, this spike thing was just sat over the middle of the payload bay during the whole entry, which was at night. It's a big shock of some sort, and all this flashing and burning was going on around it. I kept tapping everybody on the shoulder trying to get them to look at it. They were busy flying the orbiter. That's what it looks like outside the forward windows. That, that captures the color very well. We were, it was dark most uh, by our entry, so uh, we got a chance to get a fantastic light show. Vehicle uh, <clears throat> flew like it uh, normally does. Uh, we had no problems at all in entry. It was uh, completely nominal as the vehicle uh, behaved superbly throughout the flight. We had very few malfunctions. Uh, lighting was such that we couldn't pick up much many landmarks visually until we came uh, overhead Edwards. Uh, about 45,000 feet, we began to pick up normal landmarks. It was deploying the gear at about 300 feet. Uh, and we were using Lake Bed Runway 17. Uh, and that all went uh, very normal as far as we were concerned. <coughs> Touched down and uh, held the nose off until 180 knots, which is a normal way we practice it. And then uh, we derotated at about a degree per second. We have made a modification that we started at on 9 in the flight control system that gives you a little bit more uh, control over the nose uh, as you're lowering it. So a lot more positive now. Uh, I was interested in exercising the brakes since I hadn't used them very well previous times, and we have had some brake problems. Uh, we did get on the brakes pretty good, and they again malfunctioned to some degree. Here's five heavy guys climbing off, and uh, everybody maybe with a little bit of sea legs, but everybody feeling feeling very good. And that concludes our movie and presentation. So if we could have the lights, uh, thank you. This is the ascent portion of our mission. And the countdown at the Cape just went flawlessly. We were really, really pleased with the way things went down, went on down there. The engine's starting. You can see the shock waves come out of the throats of the, the nozzles. The nozzles vibrate. The engines get up and stable in about six seconds. Uh, solid rocket motors fire, and, and we're off. And uh, for a new guy doing this the first time, it's really a thrill. And that thing. We all kept on watching Crip make sure this is the way it's really supposed to be. Yeah. <laughs> okay, solid rocket motors separated. You saw the uh, plumes from the uh, separation motors. Those fog up our windows pretty good up in front. They, they put a haze on the, on the forward windows when they go off, and you get a nice flash in the windows, but it's a nice, smooth separation. 
This is our external tank coming in by Hawaii. One of our test objectives was to put that tank in so they could take pictures of it. This is the tank breaking up just south of Hawaii. And it's low light TV, so you get some blooming in it, but you can see, also see the rather large pieces of the tank and how much it's broken up. And they were trying to measure the footprint of those pieces as they came into the ocean to see how big uh, the dispersion was on them. So that's all, all bits and pieces of the big tank we carry. Looked like it lit up the area pretty good over there. Yeah. And this next picture is the orbiter coming right along behind. And if it hadn't been for the uh, orbital maneuvering system, one burn right after the main engine's cut off. So we're going right into orbit off the pad. And we're going up 250 miles, so the trajectory and everything was a little bit different. And it made, uh, made a real interesting ride out of it. The uh, solid rocket motors, the engines and everything just are magnificent. We didn't have a glitch the whole ascent, which is really nice. You don't want any glitches when this kind of stuff's going on outside your window. <coughs> it feels like being on a rough train while the solid rocket motors are firing. If you all have been on rough railroad track, that's about what it feels like. And uh, it's a very interesting ride. You can function normally. And right before we lifted off, Cripp said, get ready for the ride of your lives. And he was right. It's the ride of your life. It's, yeah, uh, it's still really a, a big thrill on your third time, too. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, one, of the, one of the neat things about this mission was we're going to do direct insertion into orbit. So we didn't do an orbit.